So uh, let me start. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter in Math and Physics Seminar Series. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me ask the audience also the, about the seminar time. Uh, earlier, we are scheduling for Monday 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Uh, because there are some possible potential conflict slightly overlap. Uh, was a uh, Swan Lam seminar. They moved to Monday morning, so we are thinking to uh, adjust possibly to, to uh, Tuesday morning, like 9.30 to 11 a.m. If the time is appropriate, then you don't need to say anything, but if it's not appropriate to you and you have a complaint, uh, please let me know. You can text me or you can just uh, put on chat or send me an email, and we'll see. I think there is always some conflict somewhere. People will complain, but uh, uh, we just need to find the time and we may need to also adjust to uh, make the best convenience for the speaker. So I will try to adjust that. Okay, so let's uh, let's start. Uh, we are very honored to invite uh, Chu Choi from Stony Brook. And uh, he will be speaking about several of his recent work on non invertible symmetry in nature. Let me remind the audience, please feel free to interact uh, ask question during the talk and let's welcome each you yeah please thank you okay. thank you Jivan, for the introduction and today i'll be talking about non invertible symmetries in nature so this talk will be based on these two recent papers that i wrote with Uta Lam and my advisor Xuan Xiao. and please also check out this paper by clay and Kantaro, which is closely related to this first paper. Uh, and as Ruben said, if you have any questions, please interrupt me at any time. So the talk will be divided into roughly two parts. So in the first part of the talk, I'll be talking about non invertible symmetries in the real world QED and QCD. And in the second part of the talk, I'll be talking about non invertible time reversal symmetries. In particular, I will mention the examples of massive QED and 3 plus 1D free Maxwell theory at rational values of the theory. In this talk, I will be interested in quantum field theories. Especially, I will only focus on relativistic quantum field theories. And global symmetries and their tube anomalies give us some robust data of a given QFT, which is matched across various dualities as well as along the RG flows. And this property uh, has been useful in recent years in checking various dualities and also in uh, constraining uh, non-trivial RG flows. And then the notion of asymmetry in QFTs has been significantly regenerated uh, in the past decade. This was followed by this pioneering paper by Gaia Dukapustin, Cyborg Willet. And also please check out this brief review talk uh, by Professor McGravy that was given at this uh, seminar series a few months ago. And I'm going to slowly motivate this, but in a single sentence, uh, the main philosophy behind this uh, generalized symmetries is that we view any topological operator in a relativistic QFT as a symmetry operator in a generalized sense. And let's try to see how that comes about. So let me begin very slowly. So as 
Let's talk about ordinary symmetries. The unknown. So a symmetry in a given quantum system manifests itself as the existence of conserved quantities or operators. So for instance, if you have a continuous symmetry and you have conserved charges due to the nodal theorem. If you have a discrete symmetry, then you cannot apply the nodal theorem. But still, there will be unitary operators implementing the symmetry transformation which commute uh, with the Hamiltonian and thus conserved along the time evolution. So let's talk about a simple example. So let's consider a 3 plus 1 BQFT uh, with a U1 global symmetry. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned this. So in this talk, whenever I say a symmetry, I always mean a global symmetry as opposed to say gauge symmetry. And I'll be only interested in global symmetry. Okay, so let's consider uh, we have a 3 plus 1 DQFT with a U1 symmetry uh, with the conserved nodal current that I write as uh, J mu. So the, there, is a, there will be a conservation equation, uh, B mu J mu equals to zero, or equivalently, uh, star J will be a closed three form. And we can construct the charge operator by simply integrating the charge density across the whole space. And to each group element, uh, alpha, which, uh, which in this case, will be some two pi periodic angle. We can uh, construct uh, the associated symmetry operator, uh, u of sub alpha, by simply exponentiating the charge operator. And thanks to this conservation equation, this u alpha will be conserved uh, along the time evolution. A uh, question, very nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you say conserve on the time, uh, do you mean this is an operator operators uh, at a stage of operator or, or taking the expectation value of the well, ground state, like uh, whether you have like mm -hmm. a, a the break the right. ground so, case? I mean that in so I'm thinking of some correlation function. I'm saying uh, by conserved, I mean inside the correlation function, I can move this around. Uh, if I can move this to, uh, operator back and uh, forth in time, and then the value of the correlation function will remain invariant. That's what I mean by conserved. So if I take a like a total time derivative dt d over mm -hmm. dt operator. Uh, and if I take this in terms of uh, expectation value of this operator, then there is a term of uh, uh, a Hamiltonian commutator with the u as one of the term, and also the, the second term is the partial t, partial partial t on u. So, so I, I, I'm asking just that the conservation here is the conservation with respect to the total time derivative or? Yeah, it's or total time, time the, derivative. But uh, in this case, this operator does not have an explicit time dependence. So the partial derivative with respect to time will just vanish. Right. And this operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. So the total time derivative will vanish. So what I just mentioned is that uh, the relation holds when I take uh, the expectation value, maybe some state or some uh, ground state. Or well, some... Yeah, we can do that, but uh, this uh, holds. Mm -hmm. Also at the operator level, it's an operator equation. Okay. As an operator, uh, the total time derivative acting on this u alpha operator will, will vanish. Well, this condition will be exactly equivalent to just Hamiltonian commute with this u. In the yes. case of the different value, I know this is true, but I, 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 I just make sure in general, this is also true. The, yeah, the this relation... is still, yeah, this is, should be still true, yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. And also you can possibly redefine in terms of not just on the space slides and you probably will discuss in the, the taking the uh, mm -hmm. deformable surface, not just the space. Exactly. Yeah, so I will just do that in the next slide. Yeah, so thank you for the comment. Okay, so uh, as I just said, uh, are we only interested in relativistic QFTs? It means that there is nothing special about the time direction. And 
in particular, any other directions in the space time uh, are on the equal plane as the time direction. Because of this, it's uh, natural to define the symmetry operator, which is, as Juven said, uh, which is supported on a closed, uh, arbitrary closed co-dimension one submanifold M inside the space time. So I'll be uh, looking at this um, more general symmetry operator supported on this three manifold M in this case. And if this M is a spatial slice, then this U alpha of M is an operator acting in the Hilbert space. If M extends along the time direction, then this is a defect uh, in your theory, which changes the Hilbert space and then the quantization of the theory. And since I'm uh, building a relativistic of this, uh, I will use these terms operator and defect interchangeably. Now, uh, thanks to the conservation equation, which says that this star J is a closed three form. Now this operator U sub alpha M becomes a topological operator. By this, I mean, inside the correlation function, if I have this, uh, symmetry operator inserted, then the value of the correlation function does not change when I try to deform the shape of this uh, three manifold M without crossing any other operator instructions. And this is simply the consequence of the Stokes theorem and then the conservation equation. And here, here we are observing that the notion of being conserved in the relativistic QF this it's really upgraded to the notion of being topological because there is nothing special about the time direction. And motivated by this, in this talk, I'm going to define any topological operator as a generalized symmetry operator in relativistic of this. I have a question. Yes. Um, so uh, if I had a finite symmetry where there isn't a conserved current, uh, are you mm -hmm. still for relativistic QFTs saying that a symmetry is the existence of a topological operator? Yes, yes, yes. So this will still hold for finite symmetries as well as continuous symmetries. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. <coughs> yeah. So once we take this uh, general philosophy of generalized symmetries, there are two uh, notable directions of generalization. So the first thing is that we can consider topological operators of co dimension P, where P is greater than one. And these are called higher form symmetries. And there, are, there is other uh, somewhat more, somewhat orthogonal direction of generalization, which are called non-invertible symmetries. And I'm going to uh, focus uh, on these non-invertible symmetries the rest of the talk, and let me try to explain what they are. So to do that, let's first go back to our previous ordinary UI symmetry example again. So we just said that to each group element, uh, say alpha or beta, there is an associated topological symmetry operator, u alpha or u beta. Now, since these two operators are topological, I can imagine putting them in parallel together and slowly merging them into a single operator. Since these two operators are topological, the resulting operator will also be topological. And in this sense, uh, in a relativistic QFT, there is a well-defined notion of multiplication in the set of topological operators. This is given by this parallel fusion. This is called fusion of two topological operators. And this generates the so-called fusion algebra between topological operators. In this case of uh, ordinary UI symmetry, or in, uh, in fact, any, uh, in any ordinary symmetries described by some group, this fusion algebra is nothing but the uh, group multiplication law. In particular, to every uh, such u alpha in this example, there will be an inverse topological operator slash defect, which is simply the topological operator associated to the inverse global element. 
So when I try to bring this U alpha with this uh, inverse operator uh, together, they will simply annihilate into a trivial operator. However, it is not the case that every topological operator in a given QFT is necessarily invertible. In particular, as I will show you later in the talk, there exist non-invertible topological operators in some QFTs. And then the generalized symmetry generated by these non-invertible topological operators are called non-invertible symmetries. So the existence of non-invertible symmetries in 1 plus 1D relativistic QFTs has been uh, known for uh, a relatively long time. But in dimensions higher than 1 plus 1, it's not really clear whether they even exist or not until very recently. But starting from the uh, last few years, uh, we, st uh, we started discovering more and more examples of non-invertible symmetries uh, in higher dimensions. And there have been this, uh, a lot of exciting developments uh, in, in this topic uh, in the past few years. Okay. Without further delay, let's, let me uh, get into non-invertible symmetries that we can see in our nature. Let's first consider uh, strip plus 1D massless QED. So I have a U1 gauge field and then the charge one massless Dirac formula. And as we all know, uh, this Lagrangian has a classical U1 axial symmetry. It rotates the fermion in this way. And famously, there is a ABJ anomaly, which uh, breaks this classical U1 axial symmetry at the quantum level. In terms of the U1 axial current, J mu A, uh, the statement is that this current is not conserved anymore due to the ABJ anomaly. In particular, D star J A will be proportional to F S F. But I'm going to argue now that this classical invertible U1 axial symmetry is actually not completely broken by the ABJ anomaly. Instead, I will show that this, uh, this classical symmetry turns into a discrete non-invertible symmetry at the quantum level. Now, I just said that in this talk, I will take the viewpoint where uh, I view any topological operator as a symmetry operator and vice versa. And in this language of topological operators, what's, what's the statement of the ABJ anomaly? Where well, this goes as follows. So if I had an actual good U1 XR symmetry, then naively I will try to construct the corresponding symmetry operator U sub alpha in this way. But now the statement of ABJ anomaly is that this naive symmetry operator is not topological anymore. So inside correlation functions, if I try to move around this uh, U alpha operator, then uh, it will not be topological, but I will have a, a say four dimensional tail where uh, I essentially have integral of F because of this, um, anomalous conservation equation and by using the zero. And one can ask, can you cure this ABJ anomaly? By this, I mean, can you do something on this most naive symmetry operator U to make it into the plus curve again? There is a somewhat natural, uh, there is first thing that comes to one's mind uh, that this is as follows. Well. So we can consider this uh, other, U, other operator, which I call uh, U hat. So here I'm adding on top of this U operator, uh, this uh, Charles Simon term, which is shown in red. Now this new operator U hat is formally conserved because the, because the integrand is closed. However, this operator is not gauge invariant on a general 
uh, three manifold M because the coefficient in front of the Charles Simons term is not properly quantized. So the situation is like this. So we have this most naive symmetry operator U. This is a case invariant, well-defined, good operator in the theory, but it's just not topological. And thus it's not a symmetry in my view. We could define this new U hat operator. This is formally topological, but it's not case invariant. So I don't want to include this operator in my theory. So it looks like we are stuck at this point, and it looks like there is no way to cure the APJ anomaly. However, at this point, let's uh, try to be slightly less ambitious because we are stuck. And instead of talking about general uh, rotation angle, let's consider a particular value of the actual rotation angle, uh, say 2 pi over n. And here, n will be some arbitrary positive integer greater than n. Let's, this, uh, let's look at this u head operator again. And it looks like this. And this operator is still not gauge invariant. Again, the gauge non invariant part is, high, is highlighted in red. And it is great non gauge invariant because the coefficient uh, in front of the Charles Simons term is fractional instead of being integral. However, for this fractional chain Simon term, there is a well-known way to fix this uh, non-gauge invariance. So let's make, uh, let's make a slight detour and take a closer look at this non-gauge invariant uh, action. So although this red expression is not gauge invariant, this is commonly used as an effective action describing the fractional economical state at filling fraction one over n. And also in, the, uh, uh, and in that context of fractional economical state, there is a well-known, uh, uh, the more precise gauge invariant way to express the fractional economical state. And this is this blue expression. So here, this little a is a dynamical U1 gauge field uh, living on this three manifold M. And basically, I have the U1 lever N Charles Simon theory, which describes the low energy uh, limit of the fractional economic state. And this uh, U1 lever N Charles Simon theory is coupled to the, uh, the electromagnetic gauge field uh, in this way. So we went from here to there. And then uh, what's the relation between two? Well, to relate the two expressions, you can first start from this blue expression. Then I can try to naively integrate out little a gauge field. So the equation of motion for little a says that little a is equal to minus big A over N. But this equation, does not make sense because both little a and big A are properly quantized U1 gauge field. In particular, they have integral fluxes, and it does not make sense to divide one of them by an integer. But I can try to brute forcefully uh, proceed and just substitute this illegal expression into my blue expression. Then I go back to this red expression which is also illegal because its expression is not gauge invariant in general. So in this context, uh, the real viewpoint that I should take is that the right-hand side uh, is really the most more precise gauge invariant way to express the fractional quantum monster. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Just make sure which state was wrong. The right hand side expression in blue is correct, gauge mm -hmm. invariant. Mm -hmm. But well, dynamical little a, you get the wrong expression on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. with the relational equation motion constraint was improper quantization. So, so mm -hmm. which is when you go to the left hand side. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the thing is that uh, this expression uh, does not make sense because of the reason I said. Uh, so relay is a proper equivalent uh, UN gauge field. It, can, it cannot be equated with big A over N because big A is also properly quantized. But, but, so, but the procedure mm -hmm. derived that, I mean, somewhere is wrong. So the, the step is wrong is to integrate out the little gauge, the little A gauge field. Oh. Mm -hmm. So what is correct is the correct expression is um, N times little A is equal to big A, but I cannot divide this equation by big A. That's, that's the wrong step. So, so I start from this correct expression, and then I install something illegal, and then I obtain something illegal. That's what's happening. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the piss. Okay, let's go back to our QED example. So we had this, you had the operator at this particular value of the extra rotation angle. And this was not gauge invariant because of this rectangular channel Simon's term. And motivated by uh, the previous discussion, let's uh, define a new operator, which I denote as D1 over N, where I replace this non-gauge invariant expression by the uh, well-defined gauge invariant expression. And again, here, little a will be a dynamical gauge field that lives only on the word volume of this uh, operator d1 over n. And you can think of it as an auxiliary field that I'm introducing to define this operator d. And in particular, inside correlation functions, for each insertion of this operator d1 over n, there will be corresponding dynamical gauge field and that live only on the defect. So as I said several times, uh, now this D1 over N operator is uh, perfectly gauge invariant because all the charge Simon's terms are properly quantized. Moreover, this operator is now topological. So this uh, fractional quantum or state degrees of freedom that lives that live on this defect are designed in such a way they carry the exact opposite amount of anomaly that can cancel the original ABJ anomaly carried by the naive symmetry operator U. And when all these things are combined, they cancel the uh, anomalies of each other, and the resulting operator D1 over N becomes topological. And now, since this operator is topological, according to the philosophy of this generalized symmetries, I should really view this operator D1 of R n as describing some symmetry of the theory. However, this new topological operator D1 of R n is not invertible. In particular, they generate a non-invertible symmetry. And intuitively, this is because the u one level and charn simon theory that I'm putting on this defect is a non-trivial, non-invertible DQFT. So we can try to verify this uh, more explicitly. So since uh, this if this operator is non-invertible, then it will, in particular, be not unitary. So let's try to check this fact. So I'm going to compute the fusion of D times uh, D with D dagger. So this is the definition of our D operator. And then D dagger operator is obtained simply by taking the Hermitian conjugate. And as I said before, for each insertion of these D operators, I will have a dynamical gauge field living on these defects. So for D, I have this little a gauge field living on D. For D dagger, I have this a bar gauge field living on D dagger. So let's compute D times D dagger. So first of all, this uh, first term coming from this uh, naive U operator. 
simply cancel each other out, and there will be four remaining terms. And this gives us this, uh, this expression. I'm going to call this uh, operator uh, as C. And this operator C is, uh, uh, nowadays, is commonly referred to as condensation defect slash operator. I'm not going to explain all the details, but this condensation defect is obtained by gauging some discrete one form symmetry only on the submanifold N. So in the language of this recent paper, this is called one gauging. But the only important point that I want to emphasize is that this CM operator is not a trivial operator. It's a non trivial operator uh, that exists uh, in the theory. Because of this, we can, very, we, uh, we can see that this D1 over N operator is not unitary. Okay. Now we can generalize this construction to any arbitrary rational angle, uh, alpha equals to two pi P over N, where P and N are some co-prime integers. This we can do by using a fractional economic state and uh, now at freeing, freeing fraction P over N. So there is a natural choice of BKFT, which describes the low energy limit of such a fractional economic state, which generalizes the U1 Leverage and Semi theory that we saw before. So these are called minimal ZNTQFTs, A and comma B. And these DQFTs are labeled by two integers go find to each other. And when P is equal to one, A and comma one is, the, is simply the uh, U1 leverage and Sam theory that we saw before. Now using this minimal DQFTs, we can construct uh, more general topological operators, EP over N, um, defined in this way. And here, this notation means that I have this DQFT living on the word volume of this operator, coupled to the bulk uh, ENM field in a specific way so that it precisely cancels the ABJ anomaly carried by the first. In this way, we obtain a set of topological operators, EP over N, where, and they are labeled by elements in Q mod C. Uh, now your question. Mm -hmm. uh, let me make sure something. Suppose we say some operator is topological, as you mm -hmm. try to define a topological operator. Uh, does it imply sometimes topological also mean gapped? Is there some notion of a gap here for those operators? Uh, for um, example, the fresh mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. this is gapped, but uh, there is mm -hmm. also some other current terms mm -hmm. from the ABJ mm -hmm. anomaly. I wonder whether there's some notion of gap for those topological operators. Well, yeah. One thing is that, uh, so in any given GFT, say um, in D dimensions, there are really degenerate examples of topological operators, which are just given by uh, lower dimensional decoupled DGFTs. Okay. And in this sense, you may say uh, where there are topological PFTs, then uh, where you can define some degenerate example of a topological operator in higher dimensional PFTs. But more generally, these are two different notions. So we can have gap to theories, um, but it's a property of a theory. And here, uh, when I say topological operator, it's a property of an operator. Right? A, pri a priori, uh, there is no relation between the two. Yeah, I, I suppose whether we say gap or, oh, sorry. <coughs> mm. I, can't I, I suppose we say gap or not relate to the fact whether the uh, eigenvalue spectrum of some operator has some uh, discretized value from the lowest eigenvalue state to the highest level eigenvalue. And 
that's usually the case if you want to define a gap system for a Hamiltonian. Here we are discussing not Hamiltonian, but some operator. I, I just wonder whether there's a notion of a gap for those cases. I certainly think they are somehow different, but I, I was just asked whether there's some relation. Uh, right. I think there might be a relation, but uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's for the case. And also, you can, you can <laughs> consider a spatial configuration of the defect, right? And then there will be a Hamiltonian that, I mean, it's like you're modifying the Hamiltonian around the defect. Mm -hmm. So that state is this defect state, right? And then the, maybe that state indeed will be gap. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's that's fine. So, yeah, so if we can insert this operator, such that it extends along the time direction, and there'll be a defect of the CLV. And if this operator is topological, then it means that this defect degrees of freedom are, are gap. Oh, is this an if only if statement like a both wave or gap? Um, I just yeah, that I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, this is yeah, I, I don't know if this is uh, if there is any rigorous statement, but this is the, what I just said is just uh, something that I would naively expect. Uh, I, I don't know if there is a general theory. Okay. Yes. And also the previous I have, slide. A, I have a comment about this point. Uh -huh. so generally, the bulk uh, in this discussion is not gapped, right? Like in QED, it's not gapped. More generally, you can have a conformal field theory in the bulk. And yet you can still have a topological defect slash operator in a gap in a bulk gapless CFT. Now, when you insert such a topological defect, um, that extends in the time direction and twists some direction in space that will lead to a Hilbert space, which also is generally not gap. In short, uh, when the bulk is gapless, I, I'm not sure if there's an invariant notion to say if the uh, degrees of freedom living on the defect is gap or not. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know whether Professor Shogun can have a comment. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the comments. About the, the fusion rule of the two of the operator D and D dagger. This fusion will still be uh unitary if n is one, is that right? If n is one, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. I wonder whether n can be has to be even. The reason is that uh, mm -hmm. whether you have something like uh, odd n sh should be fermion, mm -hmm. and the, the thing you add should be bosonic, so that requires n to be even. Do you have something like that? Oh yeah. So here, I'm, for simplicity, I'm assuming that my any manifold m is spin. Um, yeah, because I in the bulk theory of QED, it's inside fermions. It's um, the natural to assume that everything is spin. No, I mean n. This n, n in yeah. This n in this uh, in the coefficient of a. Yeah. So, right. This n do this n. So this n can be odd. Yeah. If the manifold n is uh, a spin manifold, then oh, n can okay. be odd. Otherwise, n should be even. But uh, here I'm assuming this uh, n is a spin manifold. Uh, I see. So therefore, this symmetry it cannot be defined on non-spin and manifold. I think this is correct. Yes. Well, if n is odd. Uh, uh, no, but, so, but, uh, a more but primary my... comment is that QED has fermions. So the bulk theory has fermions. Yes. So in the most high yeah. Whether n can be chosen to be non-spin, uh, that's a is that uh, possible to choose M to be non-spin? <laughs> I, I guess you need it to be spin C, is that right? For general, later be spin C. I see. Yeah, but in this paper, we are being lazy. <laughs> we assume everything <laughs> thing to simplify our lives, but that's certainly a very interesting generalization that we should think about in the future. Okay, thank you.
So one, one comment is when I mentioned n is one is like a integer quantum hole, like a maybe I'm not sure, like a new equal to one and new equal to minus one, and the unitary property still holds, and uh, they also possible relative facts that the uh, the boundary of this, you know, maybe say Carroll central charge one and minus one, this H mode can be gapped without any leftover degeneracy if there's open ends. And uh, for n is larger than one, this C both the 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 red red color this ADA and this A body and the blue color A body A bar both are non invertible. So when you try to pull them together and uh, certainly they will not be they cannot go to a trivial vacuum and if you try to gap the system also the boundary modes has some leftover uh i suppose the uh like a degeneracy boundary degeneracy of zero modes and yeah make this comment and see whether there is some further con connection to something mm -hmm. larger than one maybe there is some addition mm -hmm. that one can one can think Mm -hmm. I see. Maybe, mm -hmm. Right now, you probably consider a close uh, three manifold. Maybe, maybe one can cure this by even attaching something on the boundary of the three manifold if the three manifold is open. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I just, I just, maybe there is some possibility there. there. I see. I see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's uh, interesting. So yeah, one yeah. or, or even one lower dimension on the boundary of uh, three manifold and possibly attach. I don't know whether it works, but possibly attach something also in the two two D boundary. But I'm not sure what it makes sense, but anyway, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, as we've said in in this work, um, this uh, three manifold M is taken to be a closed manifold without a boundary, right? Yeah, but we haven't studied boundaries of this um, operator. But it, I think it would be interesting because maybe we can say something about, yeah. Uh, boundaries related to the fractional economic state as Ben said. But this is yeah, this uh, we didn't study so far. Okay. Um okay, so we def have defined this uh dp over n operator for any uh, arbitrary rational rotation angle by which I mean uh, the rotation angle is a rational number times two pi. Now let's look at the uh, action of this operator on some of, uh, some other operators. So if we look at the, this definition of this DP over N operator, you see that these uh, topological degrees of freedom don't talk to the bulk formulas at all. And then the bulk formulas only see this first term. And because of this, when this operator DP over N Axion formulas is simply x invertibly as an axial rotation by this rational uh, rotation angle. This leads to selection rules for scattering amplitudes uh, in massless GED. This tells us that the helicities of electrons and positrons should be conjugate in massless GED. And of course, this is nothing new at all. These are explained in textbooks and many uh, in many places. But usually this selection rule is not explained in terms of any symmetries. Here we are providing an exact symmetry argument for this um, selection rule using the non-invertible symmetry. And I'm not going to derive this fact, but one can also show that this DP over N operator adds in a more sophisticated way uh, on two lines. So to summarize, uh, we start with uh, this, the most naive uh, UN XR symmetry operator U, which was a good operator in the theory, but it was just not topological. And we consider this U head operator, which was formally topological, but it was not case invariant. And, and because of this, we just throw them away. However, when the rotation angle was a rational multiple of two pi, we could define this new operator dp over n, which is both topological and gauge invariant. 
the novelty was that this new operator is not invertible anymore. And this defines a non-invertible symmetry in 3 plus 1D massless QED. Now, let me move on to uh, QCD. Yeah, excuse me, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you consider uh, a model with a U1A symmetry, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you say that uh, the, uh, this one theory have this uh, non-invertible symmetry, but with arbitrary choice of P and N. Mm -hmm. So all those symmetries are present simultaneously. Do you, do you mean that? Yes, I mean that, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in particular, we have uh, symmetries that are labeled by elements in Q mode C. Okay. So now uh, let me... Uh, excuse me, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if this construction is uh, works in lower dimension of QED, like in 2D, for example? where we also have ABJ anomaly. Right, right. Yeah, that's a very good question. In, in 2D, uh, we don't know how to apply this construction because there is no analog of fractional autonomous state in 0 plus 1D, we know. But there is also a one-dimensional chern symes analog, right? Right. So if we do the same thing in, uh, in 1 plus 1D QFD, then this u head operator will have a fraction it's a, it'll be like a fractional reason line. But we don't know how to cure this, uh, partly because there is no non trivial uh, logical order in surplus. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. So, that's a point I want to ask more. So, uh, what's the issue for that? Uh, what, what's, what's the obstruction? Mm -hmm. Uh, can you uh, quantify it? So, so maybe by the criteria, like what exactly is the criteria require? I mean, for for such a non-invertible operator, uh, uh -huh. so so you can also append something in by this. Uh, we you just discussed the uh, maybe fractional Wilson line. You say right, fractional A, and you say mm -hmm. that, like, non-invertible symmetry. Uh, what's, yeah. the, what's the criteria like? So, yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, I simply don't know how to cure the fractional waste line. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't know the analog of fractional economic state in 0 plus 1D. Mm. Yeah, that's the obstruction. But you want to have a, something like a fractional quantum whole state because it has. Yes, uh, maybe something like a magnetic one point symmetry, or what exactly is the criteria? Mm. Well, yeah, that's another way to say this. Uh, so there is a, yeah, this is something I haven't presented, but uh, there is another way to construct this DP over N operator using the magnetic one point symmetry, where uh, the conserved current is just the field strength and then the conservation equation is also BMP identity. But if I have a one plus one D QED, then I don't have a magnetic one form symmetry. It's more like a magnetic minus one form symmetry. And we don't know how to use that. And, and also for higher dimension, maybe uh, you probably also know better. How about, I say, five? Five plus one D. Five plus one D. Um, yeah, yeah. In, in five plus one D, well, yeah, yeah. We haven't explored uh, higher dimensions, higher than three plus one. But I think in five plus one D, there are, uh, there will be something something we can do. Yeah, but I didn't explore in in detail. But I, yeah, but I expect there is something that can be done. But, but but related fact is that the 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 transignment term in in this in five D right is not quite topological or gap is that right? Because the equation of motion set by like something like a ADADA is not necessarily flat 
A, right? Yes. It's different from the two plus one D. So, mm -hmm. so I was hoping that maybe you know better about like what's the criteria required at least for this procedure. Like, is there some general statement or principle that what is required? Right, yeah, that, yeah, that'd be, yeah, that's an interesting case. Right. We don't have any general uh, statement about like how to construct a non-invertible symmetry. Uh, we just found this particular construction in which works in Mesley's KD uh, just recently. So yeah. Nine, nine, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe the five plus one D case may not work as as the same case as three plus one, it seems to mm -hmm. me. I don't know. Yeah. But the general mm -hmm. principle we have, which um Isho didn't present in this talk, is to use the magnetic global symmetry, as he briefly alluded to. So in one plus one D QED, there is no magnetic global symmetry. In three plus one D, there is, so we can play this trick. In five plus one D, depending on which model you look at, there might also be a magnetic higher form symmetry. And if there is such a magnetic higher form symmetry, it is possible to play the trick again. But this, so the short answer to Juven, your question, uh, what is the general principle for constructing this class of non-invertible symmetries that has been discussed in the past year? The general principle is the magnetic higher form symmetry. But, but yes, very nice. Yeah, that's what I want to hear about. How about the appending of the additional transignments like term? Because transignments three form and transignment that, that, that follows from the magnetic higher form symmetry. So that's something we work out in details in the paper, but uh, it will be too much for, for one and a half hour talk. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's a very nice question. Thanks for the interesting questions. Good for so, yeah. So now let me move on to the QCD. So historically, the ABJ anomaly was first discovered to explain the decay of neutral pion into two photons. So the ABJ anomaly was successfully used to determine the coupling constant in front of the pi zero FHF term in the pion Lagrange. And this term then can be used to derive the decay rate the neutral pion into two photons, which matches the experiment uh, very well. And now I'm going to uh, give you an alternative derivation, the same well-known result uh, about this pion decay rate using the non-invertible global symmetry. So let's consider the QCD Lagrangian for up and down quarks in the massless limit. I'm, I'm going to go below the electroweak scale so that the SU2 cross U1 gauge group is fixed down to U1 electromagnetism. And in the QCD Lagrangian, there is a classical symmetry, which I denote as U1A3. And this U1A3 rotates the up and down quarks in this manner. And note that there is this sigma 3, and upon chiral symmetry breaking, uh, this Direction corresponds to the neutral pion. And this U1A3 symmetry is a classical symmetry of the Lagrangian, but if it suffers from the ABJ anomaly with the U1 electromagnetic gauge group. So the situation is exactly the same as in the previous massless QED example. And we can run the same arguments uh, in this QCD case to construct the non-invertible symmetry operators, dp over n, uh, below the electroweak scale. If we go to uh, deep IR, then this, this, uh, this city is just a series of uh, ions, which are the lightest hadrons. And it is described by the pion Lagrangian. In particular, I'll be interested in uh, only these two terms. Uh, so I have the kinetic term for the neutral ion, and there will be pi zero FSF coupling. And for now, I will pretend that I don't know the value of this coupling constant G. So the pion is a compact scalar, and where the periodicity is set by the pion decay constant, and it gets shifted under this classical U1A3 symmetry. 
Now, since uh, in the UVQCD, we say that we said that there are these non invertible symmetries, BP over N. One can ask how this pi and Lagrangian in the IR matches this symmetry. And here, UV is really inside the quotation mark because by this, I mean the QCD below the electroweak scale, which is still way above the pion scale. There was the, uh, our pion Lagrangian. And in particular, we expect this D1 over N operator slash defect to be realized in the IR pion Lagrangian. And for, D1 over, for this D1 over N defect could be a consistent defect in the IR theory. The equations of motion in the presence of this defect should be consistent with each other. So let's check that. So I'm going to insert this D1 over N defect along X equals to zero locus. Then I can derive the equations of motion that are localized on the defect. And then I obtain these three equations. So briefly, since this uh, pion field is shifted by the U1A3 symmetry, this first term basically introduces the discontinuity uh, of the pion field across the defect. And I also said uh, additional equations of motion coming from varying little a and big a. And these three equations are consistent with each other only if the coupling constant G takes this particular value. And it turns out uh, this is the correct value that is uh, observed experimentally. So here we see that by matching the non invertible symmetry from the UVQCD to the IR pion Lagrangian, we can correctly reproduce the well known result. Uh, it's, uh, by this, I mean, we can fix the value of this coupling constant, which can then be used to correctly predict the decay rate of the neutral pion into two photons. So, more conventionally, this uh, the same result is derived by treating the electromagnetic gauge field as background fields. And this is perfectly justified since the fine structure constant in nature is small. And in this case, the same result follows simply from the ordinary to the anomaly matching condition. Here, we are providing an alternative explanation of this well-known fact using the non-invertible global symmetry. This demonstrates that the non-invertible symmetry is really matched under an RG flow that exists in real nature. One may even say that the neutral pion decays because of the non-invertible symmetry. Okay, with that, let me now move on to non-invertible time reversal symmetries. So, so far, the non invertible symmetries that we saw in QED and QCD are internal symmetries in the sense that they don't talk to uh, the space time geometry. But one can also have some non invertible space time symmetries. In particular, the existence of non invertible time reversal symmetries in strip plus one decade series. Was first pointed out in this paper by KD Murray Chang last year. And we have discovered uh, just a month ago some uh, few other examples of non invertible time reversal symmetries in strip plus 1D. In particular, I will tell you about the massive QED and then the free Maxwell theory examples. So let's uh, first talk about the QED case. And let's first go back to the massless QED example, and where we had this uh, non invertible uh, axial symmetry generated by the P over N topological operators. And on top of this non invertible symmetry, massless QED, uh, as we will we'll know, is time reversal symmetry. So this theory has an ordinary invertible time reversal symmetry, which I denote as K. But now, 
I'm going to turn on a uh, uh, mass deformation uh, given like that. So here M is some positive real constant and theta is the phase uh, of the uh, complex mass parameter. So once I turn on this generic uh, mass deformation, both of these symmetries are explicitly broken. So under the time reversal transformation, the mass term will be complex conjugated, which means that it's phase zeta met to minus zeta. So unless zeta is either zero or pi, this time reversal symmetry is explicitly broken. Similarly, for this non-invertible symmetry dp over n, we saw that this symmetry acts on formulas just like an axial rotation. And because of this, uh, any mass term breaks this uh, non-invertible symmetry. However, let's say this uh, value of this phase uh, vector zeta is pi times a uh, rational number, p over n, where p and n are called pi. In this special case, we can actually see that the composition of k and dp over n actually preserves the mass deformation. So when zeta is uh, at this particular value under dp over n, it simply flips the sign. This can then be undone using this k transformation and Russian transformation. So in pictures, uh, it looks like this. In Messel's QED, we have these two symmetries. Uh, one is non-invertible and the other is invertible time process symmetry. Once I turn on uh, this uh, complex mass deformation with this rational phase uh, angle, both of these symmetries are explicitly broken. However, when I compose these two, it becomes a good symmetry, a massive KD. So therefore, we have this uh, non-invertible, this, this symmetry, which I denote as T superscript set equals to pi P over N, which is a composition of K and D uh, in this massive KD theory. And so is there a case? So, okay, so yeah, in particular, this, uh, this symmetry in massive QD is a non invertible time reversal symmetry. There's a time reversal symmetry because we have K, it is non invertible because of dp over n. So, although both of these uh, K and dp over n are explicitly broken, their composition uh, is preserved by this mass deformation and makes into the non-invertible time reversal symmetry in massive QD. So the massive QD uh, with this particular best value of the uh, complex mass parameter flows to the free Maxwell theory at, the, at this value of zeta angle in the IR. This is simply because I can rotate this phase away uh, in the mass term in the UV mass security at the cost of introducing this U1 zeta anchor. And then since the formula is kept, I can just integrate it out. And in the IR, I'm just left with this free max theory. And because of this, we would expect that the three plus one D free max theory should also have a non-invertible time reversal symmetry at this rational value of the zeta anchor. And let me try to explain how that is realized. Excuse me, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. When the mass term is off, m is zero, the time reversal and the the invertible one and also the non-invertible symmetry are both both layer, right? Only yes, when, exactly. Only for the mass term on the some combination of them survive, which you call non-invertible time reversal symmetry. That's correct, yes. And, and okay, and when when M is zero, do you also have a constraint on the RG flow? Uh -huh. when, so you say when M is non-zero, the massive QED flow to the the Maxwell theory with some set of fractional angle. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And when when M zero, maybe the, is there some other flow to say? Um, probably not. Not really. It's a massless security, so yeah. I don't think I. Yeah. Okay. It's an IR free theory. Anyway, thanks. Okay, so yeah. Now let's uh, let me move on to the frame extra study. Now let me uh, begin very slowly. So the Lagrangian of the frame extra theory in three plus one D uh, looks like this, as we all know. It has the kinetic term and then the theta term. And the theory is uh, usually parameterized by the complex fight coupling constant tau, and it enjoys the SL2G duality, which is generated by S and T transformations. And again, uh, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that my spacetime manifold admits a spin structure, so that theta is two pi periodic, and T is a good duality transformation, and then I have the full SL2G duality group. And let me first review the well-known ordinary invertible time reversal symmetries of the Maxwell theory. So let's consider the most naive time reversal transformation that I again denote as K. It's, uh, I choose to act on uh, the gauge field in this way. And we know very well this time reversal transformation K flips the sign of the set angle. In terms of the complexified coupling constant, this is equivalent to saying that tau goes to minus tau bar. And originally, we say that since K flips the sign of the set angle, if set is zero, then this is a symmetry of the theory. So as set equals to zero, we have the time reversal symmetry, which is simply k. However, we also know very well that since theta is 2 pi, period, uh, 2 pi periodic, as theta equals to pi, there should also be a time reversal symmetry. If I were to be very precise, then as theta equals to pi, the nature of the time reversal symmetry is slightly different from uh, that at set equals to zero. This is because if I first apply the k transformation, then set equals to pi maps to set equals to minus pi. But then I need to further apply the t duality transformation to go back to the original value of uh, set angle. So as set equals to pi, the time reversal symmetry is really the composition of this k and t transformations. Finally, there is a slightly less known fact, which is that the pre maxwell theory also has an invertible ordinary time reversal symmetry if the value of the complex byte coupling constant lies uh, on a unit circle. For instance, this is revealed in these uh, nice papers. And there is nothing deep about this. This is simply because the fact that if we are on a unit circle, then the S duality transformation simply flips the sign of the set angle. This is because minus one over tau is equal to um, minus tau bar if tau is on a unit circle. So we see that at these values of the coupling uh, constant, we can construct the time reversal symmetry by composing K uh, with this S duality transformation. So at these values of uh, coupling constants, we have ordinary time reversal symmetry. But their nature are slightly different. But we, in general, we learned the lesson that its time reversal symmetries are obtained by composing the most naive time reversal symmetry transformation K with some other transformation such that the theory is invariant under the composite uh, transformation. Now recall that even in the massive QED case, the non invertible time reversal symmetry there was also of this kind. So there, the non invertible time reversal symmetry 
was a composition of k and b p over n. But this was non invertible simply because b p over n is non invertible. Now one can ask, uh, can you find a similar construction in the Maxwell theory at other values of tau? So to answer this question, uh, let me again make a slight detour and let's talk about interfaces. So I'm going to consider an interface, which I denote as i to pi over n. It's uh, exists in the Maxwell theory given by this expression. But from now on, uh, whenever I say an interface, I mean, I mean something supported on the co-dimension one locus in the space-time, which divides two different QFTs. So if I have an interface from the left, I have QFT1. To the right, I have QFT2. So this interface i to pi over n is defined by uh, the U1 level insurance sample theory again, living on the interface coupled to the bulk uh, electromagnetic field. And I claim that this interface I to pi over n separates two Maxwell series where the set angles on the two sides differ by minus two pi over n. So to check this, uh, we can do something similar to what we did in the neutral ion example. So I'm going to insert this interface i to pi over n along this x equals to zero locus. And to the left of the interface, I have the Maxwell theory as zeta equals to zeta minus. And to the right of the interface, I have the, again the Maxwell theory as zeta equals to zeta plus. And now we investigate the equations of motion similar to before. And I obtain these two equations. And we can see that these two equations are consistent with each other if and only if the two set angles differ by minus two pi over n. So this verifies that this is a consistent interface uh, when the set angles uh, jump by minus two pi over n across the interface. Moreover, uh, I'll not prove this, but the interface i two pi over n is a topological interface. And this can be proved using, um, by gauging some discrete magnetic one form symmetry in the half of the space time, but I will not uh, prove this right now. And Again, uh, by replacing the U1 level and Schoen Simon theory by this minimal TQFT, A and comma P, we can construct a little more general interface, I to pi, over, to pi P over N, across which the zeta angle jumps by minus two pi P over N. Your P and N can be any uh, arbitrary integer scope prime to each other. Okay, now let's go back to our discussion of time reversal symmetries. Let's say we have a Maxwell theory where the value of the zeta angle is some rational number times uh, i. So I have i p over n. In this case, something special happens. This topological interface i 2 pi p over n that we just defined simply flips the sign of the zeta angle. If the value of the zeta angle uh, takes this particular value. And therefore, we can now compose this topological interface to pi p over n with the most naive time reversal symmetry transformation k. And then the composition will leave the theory invariant. And this will define the time reversal symmetry as we learned from the ordinary invertible time reversal symmetries in the next verse. Again, this is a time reversal symmetry because there is K. But now this symmetry is non-invertible because of this pi to pi p over n interface. Again, roughly, this is because the topological degrees of freedom living on this interface define uh, 
non-trivial, non-involved coherent decay thing. But to summarize, we have uh, these uh, invertible ordinary time reversal symmetries that are well known. And on top of this, at every rational value of the theta angle in the free maxwell theory, there exists a non invertible time reversal symmetry. Qu question? Yes. Does this mean that uh, at these rational values of theta, the partition function is uh, real? Um, It's um uh, it's a little bit tricky, I think, because yeah, yeah, it's a little it, it, that might not be the case. I think in this case because yeah, it would be would be pretty strange because we know that uh, theta in general it's complex and then these values are probably dense. So you would... I think in in general what this will imply is that um. There will be a let's say I, I compute the value of the partition function some on some oriented closed manifold M. Then I compare the value of the partition function computed on M bar. Then if I have an ordinary invertible time reversal symmetry, then these two partition functions will be equal to each other. In particular, this will mean that the partition function is real. But for this case, I think. The best I can get is maybe the relation between the partition function on M with the partition function on M bar, but with the Maxwell theory with some magnetic one point symmetry gazed. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I see. And then maybe yeah, I think that's best I can get this. I see. I see. Maybe one, one more question, actually, if, if you go slightly back. Uh... Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe maybe one more, even even one more, <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess you can put this uh, interface even if theta doesn't vary by two pi n, but then the partition function just becomes zero. Is that? Uh, oh yeah, then yeah, I think that could be the case. Yeah, yeah. If yeah, if the theta doesn't jump by this value, then. Um, Equations of motion are not consistent. So I can equivalently say that the interface does not define a consistent configuration. I have some possibly related questions. Mm -hmm. First of all, following up on what you just said, does it mean that the expectation value of this interface is zero? Is that just inserted? Um, can I interpret it that way? Uh, like, I have answered by itself. Without any, without any other operators. Mm -hmm. um, not exactly sure. So if I um, insert this interface, well, the theta angles uh, don't differ by this amount, then I kind of don't know how to proceed because, because this configuration is just inconsistent. So I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, my question was actually misguided. If you actually just insert this interface, then the, uh -huh. indeed, the theta angle does jump. Yes, it that's does. The, that's it the does. consistent thing. And then and then yes. understanding what the web is, is a separate discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I guess the, the other question I have is, what are the um, selection rules that this leads to on the operators of Maxwell theory? Could, could you uh, that? That's a very good question. So, so if I do a free Maxwell theory in just a flat, um, R4 space time. If I look at the uh, correlation functions between say, local operators, then there is simply no set of dependence. And That's it's kind of, is. yeah. Yeah, so the selection really is kind of trivial. Yeah. It's a free theory. So, um, but yeah. isn't it a bit con confusing? I mean, if it's, a, if it's really a genuine global symmetry, then there should, it should mm -hmm. lead to selection rules. It should be faithfully mm -hmm. represented. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on that? What would it mean yeah. for global symmetry to exist without leading to selection rules? Well, the select, I'm saying that there exists a selection rule, but uh, I'm just saying we don't learn uh, much, much anything new because it's a free theory and we already know the answer. Well, the selection rule is there. Well, well maybe, maybe there are some selection rules on... Uh... On online operators, like that, that's what I'm asking. It's it's Maxwell theory, so the only interesting operators it has are line operators. 
Well, it has it has tri- some local operators, but it's a free theory, so it's not that interesting. But there are line operators. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so what are the selection rules on line operators? Yeah, are yeah, there selection something. rules on mm-hmm. on electric line operators, magnetic ones, ionic ones? Like, if so, what are they? What do they imply? Right, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, uh, we haven't uh, analyzed this action of this non-invertible time reverse symmetry on line operators. It's something we okay. kind of want, want to do. But uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Oh, oh, but, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this mm-hmm. is Hota. I, I just want to add something. So, uh, the the topological defects actually acts in a very simple way, it's, or in, invertibly on local operators and on Wilson lines. So, if you look at correlation function just involving local operators and Wilson lines, they all respect uh, time 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 reversal transformations. But uh, the actions on a top line is much complicated, and uh, we don't have anything to concrete to say at this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, uh, what is the difference between the Wilson and the Tophold? I didn't get what Hoda said. Mm. So again, here there is a so there there is a magnetic one form symmetry playing along with some not explaining in detail. So the dif- difference between the two is that the Wilson line does not carry a magnetic one form symmetry charge, but the two line does. And that's the difference. Okay, thanks. I, I didn't follow the answer from you given to Max about whether the partition function is real value or is time reversal. I think you make a, a long comment. Can you summarize again? Yeah, so the short short answer is that I don't think the time reversal. I mean, I don't think the value of the partition function will be real uh, at fraction of value of the set angle, but there are st- can still be some relation that we can uh, derive. The short answer is that the partition function will not be real. But uh, will be the extra constraint. Mm-hmm. The well, thing is that, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so to explain this, I probably need to explain many other things. So maybe in the post postpone this question to the end of the day. Yeah, I need to explain this, uh, how the one thing symmetry plays a role in this case. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Okay, yeah, so we are here. So we saw all these uh, invertible and non-invertible time versus symmetries. And in the picture, I can summarize in, in this way. So this is the complex top plane parameterized in the gray Maxwell theory. And this uh, gray shaded region is the uh, fundamental domain of SL2C. And along these red lines, the right goes to zero, the right goes to pi, and on the unit circle, there are these formi- familiar invertible time symmetries. So we saw that at every rational value of the set angle, which are uh, depicted by these blue particle lines, there also exist non-invertible time reversal symmetries. So there are a few other examples of non-invertible time reversal symmetries that we discovered. So this inc- includes um, pure PSD and young mill theory at uh, zeta uh, equals to some integer multiple of pi. So let me recall that uh, if you have a PSD and theory, and the periodicity of the set angle is 2 pi n because of the fractional instantness. So naively, you would say if the value of the set is not 0 or pi times n, there is no time reversal symmetry. But actually, this is to pick, and then one can show that at any integer multiple of the set angle value, there exists a non invertible time reversal symmetry. And for n, when n is an even integer, this was explained uh, in the paper by uh, KD and Marie Cheng, I swear. And finally, there are uh, also examples of non invertible time reversal symmetries in any course to four super young mass uh, with SUN gauge group along the unit circle on the conformal manifold. So, with that, let me summarize. So, it said that the general philosophy of generalized global symmetries is that we view every topological operator in a given relativistic QFT 
as a symmetry operator in a generalized sense. We saw that in real world QED and QCD below the electric scale, there exist discrete non-invertible symmetries arising from a classical U1 symmetry, which is so far from the ABJ alone. In QED, the non-invertible symmetry leads to selection rules, implying that fermion helices are conserved in scattering amplitudes. In QCD, the non-invertible symmetry is reproduced in the IL pi on Lagrangian, and from the matching condition, we can successfully post-stick the decay rate of the neutral ion into two photons. We also saw that there exists non-invertible time reversal symmetries. In particular, uh, in massive QED, if the phase of the complex mass parameter takes a rational value, then there exists non invertible time reversal symmetry. Similarly, we saw that in the free maxwell theory, there is a non invertible time reversal symmetry at every rational value of the setting. So if we, for a second, forget about non invertible versus invertible, we may say that the uh, free abelian gauge theory in Swift 1D is almost always time reversal invariant in the space of the set angle. It would be really nice if we can find uh, many other new generalized global symmetries, uh, hopefully in nature or in other interesting theories. And there are several uh, interesting questions that we couldn't completely re resolve. For instance, it's quite tempting to interpret neutral pion as a gold version for a non vertebral symmetry simply because pi zero is shifted by the non-invertible symmetry. But at this moment, we don't quite know what we even mean by a good symbolism for a non-invertible symmetry. And also the symmetry is, is not quite a continuous symmetry. So we don't know what to say at this moment. And also uh, regarding the time reversal symmetry, it could be interesting to study uh, we have, we have this with non invertible time reversal symmetries on unoriented manifolds. So, for ordinary time reversal symmetries, we put the theory with a time reversal symmetry on an unoriented manifold to detect some subtle to the anomalies, say. So, it would be interesting if we can do something similar for non invertible time reversal symmetries as well. With that, I will end my talk and thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richu, for the great talk. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's consider a, a trivial state with no symmetry in three dimensional space. But there we can have a domain wall for bosonic quantum Mahal space, which looks topological. So, so can I say that so then we always, those domain work can also be viewed as a non-invertible symmetry. Yes, yeah, they can be, but they just don't act faithfully uh, in the theory. Okay. Oh, sorry, faithfully in which sense? In the sense that it does not act on any operator. In particular, if we have a trivial trivial gap theory, then there is no operator at all. Let me just make sure again. So Gang's question is saying that whether gap domain wall or gap interface for some topological order can be regarded as uh, non-invertible global symmetries topological operator. Is that a question? So yeah, let me try to 
saya yang hmm. baik saya tak bincang so the you said yes, a, yes 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 so the in a given gravity if I put a lower dimensional decoupled gravity on some complex sub manifold then this will define a topological operator and uh, you may say well, it's a symmetry operator but this does not act on any other operators in the theory so it's not a faceful symmetry Yeah, but, but I saw that he is asking maybe the uh, interface or gap interface or gap domain wall of a TQFT topological order. Is that right? Maybe I just missed you. That's a good question. Uh -huh. Is that a question? The question was they say the gap domain wall interface of topological order, whether it can be regarded as uh, generalized. Non-inputable global symmetry, uh, topological operator. Uh, I, I think the Shaogang's question was that the, the setup was I have a three plus one D trivial, trivially gap theory with that with no symmetry, and um, I can consider putting a two plus one D bosonic monomer state, or right, across some co-dimension one uh, locus, and this thing will be topological, and I can move it around. The question was, can I view it as a symmetry? Yeah. And then the answer that I gave was that uh, right, it's a topological operator, but it does not act on any other operators. It's not a face for symmetry. OK, great. I, I get it. But then I can ask the question I ask. I say, mm -hmm. if I, um, let's say, any dimensional TQ of T, and I can classify the, the interface between the TQ of T itself to the other T, or maybe the TQ of T to a trivial vacuum. So these are interface or domain wall. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are uh, co-dimension co one operators living inside the TQ oh. And then you oh. cannot do the fusion mm -hmm. those uh, operators. Mm -hmm. those, are, those, are, those are also topological operators. Is that right? Uh, those so are, it, no, oh. in, in general, say so five an interface, uh, which divides two different QFTs. And it's not a symmetry because it's an interface between two different theories. Right, but I can also have the same, uh, the interface between the same theory. Maybe that interface. Yeah, in, in that case, it's a symmetry, yes, yes. Okay. yes. Oh, I have another question. Um, before that, I should say this is a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of, say the discussion of chiral symmetry and it's not invertible uh, chiral symmetry. For, as far as local operators go, uh, while, while this way of seeing how, how they're acted on is really cool, uh, the fact that um, QD obeys all of the selection rules of a chiral symmetry, even though it doesn't have one, could have been deduced from the fact that there are no instant times in R4. Exactly. So by yes. this, I mean that on R4, the, the fact that say there's no expectation value for psi bar psi, psi bar left, psi right, could have been deduced from the fact that there are no instant times exactly. uh, on R4. Mm -hmm. But if we go on T4, then there are QED instant times. Then because of that, I would expect psi bar left, psi right to pick a web in general. Mm -hmm. uh, now, okay, before somebody telling me there's a symmetry, I would have said, oh, whatever, no problem, <laughs> right? But now the statement is there's a symmetry. And mm -hmm. for a normal invertible global symmetry, this would be a contradiction, right? You mm -hmm. have to have finite volume selection rules that follow from symmetries. So mm -hmm. I think what's happening is that non-invertible symmetries simply don't lead to selection rules in finite volume in general. Mm -hmm. Do you agree or am I mis misunderstanding something? Like how so is it consistent? I, I would say that, so on a finite volume, mm -hmm. so, right, so matter of uh, how to call it, but there are, we can still relate some correlation function, but the relation will be more complicated. I think it was also explained in the in your recent paper as well. So in general, yeah, to derive any selection rule using these topological operators in a finite volume, I try to make a small bubble of this operator mm -hmm. and then make it bigger, bigger, and then shrink mm -hmm. it on the other side of the uh, right, so so you really seem to need yeah. cluster decomposition. That that's what we thought, but I I was, I was curious. Yeah. If this is yeah. something that 
Yeah. Is so it a segment uh, of our imagination or not? Okay. Yeah. So on a complex space, it will be more delicate. But let me make a comment. I, I think I have a very simple counter example to the claim, uh, okay. Alex, you made. So let's consider one plus one the icing conformal field theory. Let's okay. put it on a sphere. It's compact. Consider the so in icing conformal field theory, there, there's an identity mm -hmm. operator. There's an epsilon operator of conformal weight one half comma one half. There's a spin operator of conformal weight one sixteen comma one sixteen. Mm -hmm. The spin operator, the sigma, is charged under Z2. And therefore, if you consider the three-point function of sigma on the sphere, it vanishes because of the Z2 selection rule that everyone knows. What about the three-point function of epsilon, the operator with conformal weights one half comma one half? Epsilon is Z2 even. So naively, you would say, oh, there should be a three-point function between uh, the epsilons. But that's not true because uh, we know the fusion rules in the icing conformal field theory, mm -hmm. the three-point function of epsilon vanishes. So how do we understand the fact that the three-point function of epsilon on the compact two-sphere vanishes? Oh. It can be understood from the Kramer's one-year non-invertible duality line. So that's the simplest possible selection rule that one can derive on local correlation function from the non-invertible symmetry. Right. Space. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting example. But I think in that case, correct me if I'm wrong, I might just be wrong here. But I, I think this, this non-invertible uh, defect doesn't act just by multiplying epsilon by a phase, right? The way it acts, so if you have such a Kramer's one-year line in Euclidean space-time, and you try to move it past the epsilon operator, mm -hmm. it simply flips the sign of epsilon. Just flips the sign. Yeah. I see. So how does... Uh, Okay, I have to think about that. I don't actually understand how precisely you would derive this selection rule without invoking cluster decomposition or something like that. Well, uh, in compact space, what you do is, is exactly what you usually do for an invertible Z2. You nucleate mm -hmm. a little bubble of the Kramer's one-year line, and then you shrink it to the other side. Here, it's simple because the way the Kramer's one-year non-invertible line acts on the epsilon is just by a sign. I see, the, I see, that's, oh, that's, the, that's the issue. It, okay, I see, it acts by a sign and not- But you're acting in a more subtle like way on the spin operator. But here mm -hmm. we are only talking about a three point mm -hmm. function of epsilon. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, so, a, that's an interesting example, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting, thanks. I have a question about the, the figure you show about organizing various uh, invertible or non-invertible non -invertible T symmetry on, on this, uh, this fundamental domain, yes, this one. So can you say something more about the triality defects and duality defects? Maybe I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I didn't explain this, but uh, so, so there are other non-invertible symmetries in the Maxwell theory, the special values of the coupling constant that we found in a paper from last November and this April. So for instance, uh, so this local duality defect arises from the self-duality of the theory under gauging some discrete long form symmetry. So for instance, if I am at a uh, high equals to two I, and the Maxwell theory is actually invariant under gazing the G2 subgroup of the electric long form symmetry. And because of this, I have this uh, duality defect, non invertible symmetry. And triality defect is something a little bit more involved, where it's uh, essentially the same, but when it defines the self duality under gazing, we include some discrete torsion. So, at the special values of coupling constants, the Maxwell theory is invariant under gazing the electric one form symmetry again, but with a particular choice of the discrete torsion. And from this, we have a non invertible trial to defect symmetry. So you, you can locate all of these on the plot, like a, mm -hmm. 
everything is known. No, no, no. Uh, no uh, uh, yeah. It's, this guys. is a by no means uh, exhaustive list. So these are the symmetries that we've found so far, but uh, there could be many other symmetries in free next year, so. And the D8 and D12 here, the 8 and 12 is the, the value of N or P or... The, these are the, um, so D8 is the dihedral group of order 8. Mm -hmm. D12 is the dihedral group of the um, order 12. So at these uh, special points, we can see that this uh, set I equals the zero line and this um, unit circle intersects. So we have a we actually have an extended symmetry. And this is simply because at this point, uh, this tau equals to i is the self-duality point. So the S-duality transformation becomes an internal C4 symmetry. And combined with the time reversal, it generates this uh, dihedral group. And there will be also a larger dihedral group, like D. Exactly. D so at, uh, so this point is uh, the triality point. And at this point, the uh, TS duality transformation generates an internal uh, C6 symmetry. Because of this, we have this extended symmetry. So generally, there's a DA times, sorry, what's the principle? There's a D, DA, D12, and there will be larger one. There are D16. No, there is no D16. It's just here. It's only these two points. So those only these two. OK. Anyway, thanks. Sorry for asking the random question. But anyway. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, any other question, comments? Oh, last chance. OK, if not, let's, let's thank each, each one again.